Um, hey, welcome everybody to How Autism Inspires. Um, the event is being recorded so that our community can go to the together. Uh, many of that was in class, uh, we're not able to do it. And um, we are recording so that, um, that we can build our community even from inside of these. So, um, to introduce this event, um, this event was born from families like ours, um, with the support from Inspire Community Outreach, Ben Ray, and St. Bonds. I wanted to thank St. Bonds, and especially Brendan Bear, um, for the continued support as they work to connect with families all over the city. Um, special thanks to Lisa Brown and all the dozens of families who were able to share with us to help this magic happen. Um, I want to share a special thank you to our speakers, uh, Matthew Bull, um, um, David, um, David Franz, and Adam Schwartz for sharing some of themselves so that we can grow together and celebrate our diversity and the diversity within our amazing community. Um, let's see. This is my family. Um, my name is Angela Thieler, and I'm the founder of Inspire Theater Outreach, or Inspire. And uh, which supports families and youth with community challenges and solving social screen. Compassion, inclusion, and education. I'm an advocate, I believe strongly in human rights, and I'm a mother of four incredible heroes. And I have a son of autism. Me and Keith, you guys. So, <laughs> me and just turned six years old. When we were given this diagnosis several years ago, and darkness that I felt was so hard to explain. The diagnosis changed my life. Not because he was any different from the day before, but because no matter where we go, disability disability is not expected. The world was not made for families like ours, but that can change. The son, uh, my son has opened me up uh, to a world that I could not have imagined. We have had challenges, and you know that this picture kind of perfectly describes our family. Um, but we've also had a great connection. Joy. He's a light man. I have come to an understanding um, that autism and neurodiversity is actually a thing. Through this process, I have learned to embrace my own neurodiversity. I try to be on the lens for the first time in my life. Growing up, um, I identified a person who's neurodiverse. I grew up in a, in a really challenging, um, in a really challenging environment. And my brain has changed. For a long time, I thought, I'm just going to fake it. I'm going to fake it that I'm typical. I'm going to fake it. And through loving my son and raising my children, um, I can see that you know, that's not who I was meant to be. I was meant to be a person. I am, and I'm going to celebrate that. So I'm a little bit more like this. What is that? Oh, that's just my mind. Um, I think I'm kind of like a rainbow, which is one of the reasons why the Inspire logo is a rainbow. Because um, being a is a celebration. Curious again, guys. You're going to get to know my beautiful son. Um, what is the size of the fence of the gift? What is the size of the welcoming of these beautiful things throughout our society, throughout the world? And this would be a really good place to live. And that's why I hope to do as an advocate, as someone who believes in the rights and rights of people and children. Um, this is what I am hoping for people to see. And as we go through Inspire and support the community as a community, um, I really enjoy the process of inviting families to tell us what they need to try this group today. Because families, dozens of dozens of us said, I need hope, I need to see celebration, I need to celebrate this diversity in my family, and understand it in a really different way. And that's why we're here, that's why Inspire is around, is to support these amazing families like ours, to feel hopeful and connected, and feel proud that these beautiful children an adult in our community. So welcome here. Welcome. I'm going to introduce you to some amazing people that I'm so, so honored to be here to share my time with. And thank you. We invite all of our community to tell us what they love to see. Um, it's not about us without us. We want families to be what families get from programming and education, and you guys are important to us. So, um, I would love to uh, introduce uh, my colleague and friend Matthew. Uh, Matthew Go is uh, actually the son of in high school. He's really, truly an inspiration. He 
he actually is the founder um, and creator of the Matthews Autism Journal, which is, uh, I recommend everybody go and check it out on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and he has 40,000 followers. I didn't even know that it was that many people that were on Facebook. So I would love to invite him to come up and share with us a little bit about his story so that we can feel inspired. Facebook actually is <laughs> <laughs> Almost like, like, what is it, one in four people that live on this planet on Facebook or something? Like <laughs> 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 yeah. Start? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you all today. My name is Matthew Phillips, and I'm the founder of the Matthews Autism Journey Facebook page. And I'm not sure if many of you have heard of it yet, but it's quite, uh, it's grown to quite popular, especially within the local area here. Um, I started it one night last October, it was October 1st, 2016, so it's good to see you. Because for a long time, I was wanting to do something to show people that I'll just be Things. And I didn't know what that would mean. I mean, I had never really been much of a social media person beforehand, but I decided, well, I see what some other people can do to raise awareness for their causes. So I thought, well, why not? Why not make one for myself? And frankly, I never expected it to be that successful. Um, but I started it that night, and the next day I put it together. I downloaded it, like, I just I wrote up all the biographies and stuff, and I just set it up, and I launched it. Um, within, I want to say it was within three days, I had 500 followers, I had uh, a little over 300,000. The messages just started pouring in. Um, people asking about my experiences, people wondering what it's like to be autistic, people wanting to hear my story. So it was a really good response that came in over the first little while, and I was really happy with it. Um, I think after, yeah, and then it had a, there was a special graphic I made about how uh, kids with autism on health, this was last October, kids with autism on health deserve to get treats too. And the idea behind that was the fact that, for example, you might have a non-verbal autistic kid, if they want to try to treat too, they might, they wouldn't be able to say, or whatever that you know, they that. So the idea behind that the graphic that I made was that everyone deserves to be accepted. That was the message behind it. So it said, um, it said that all people can be autistic. So if an autistic person shows up at your door, I'll tell them you still give them a treat even if they can't see through the Which is a good message. That made went pretty viral and got over 250,000 views. So today, uh, Matthew's audience has turned into 40,000 followers. It uh, is been a huge part of my life in the last year. Um, it's brought a new perspective to my life. It's allowed me to see the perspective and idea of so many different people. I've connected with so many different people in the artist community through Facebook. I've uh, learned a lot of the stories. Uh, a lot of parents have messaged me saying that I've helped them understand their kids better, which is really hard for me to do. I want to help people. I want to help people. So if my message helps people, and which it has, so it really hurt me, it really wants to hurt people. Because if they tell me that it is helping to them understand their kids, because then I know I've done a good job and I'm doing it for a while, for all the work I put into it, because it's helping people. Um, since the beginning of October 2016, the Matthew Sargent's journey page has had quite a few successes. It's had 30 million views. Uh, tens of thousands of video minutes. It has views from over every country in the world, or from almost every country in the world. It's made a difference right here in Winnipeg. It was featured on global news, uh, television network, back to the news in April. Uh, they did a piece on TV, and it was also featured in the Winnipeg Metro and State TV and radio. Um, we also were at the Winnipeg Convention at the home this past spring, but probably one of the most Exciting things that happened um, last November when Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, directly recognized our page publicly. And that was absolutely huge for me because the fact that Mark Zuckerberg saw what I was doing 
and the university to try to make a difference. Uh, and that was back when we had like 3,000 followers. So the fact that we posted that early on was pretty really incredible. And I mean, not too many people who can follow pages will actually get sleep by time for themselves. But thought that what I was doing was really, really amazing. And that just keeps me driving fun going. Um, and he also helped us grow our page a little bit too. Um, so these achievements are certain achievements that I can tell you. If you want to check it out the Facebook page, go to Facebook and search Matthew's Octave Conversion, or just type in the URL bar, uh, facebook.com slash Matthew's journey, and then if you follow it, like the page, it will be uh, able to see updates for what I write on Facebook. So a little bit of a my story, I was diagnosed with autism uh, before the age of two. Okay? So I was born in the middle of the day. Um, but at the time, there wasn't much services for people with autism care. There wasn't a lot of programs, and it just, there wasn't as much awareness as there is today. So we had to go to Calgary, Calgary, Alberta, for a four year program. It was at the Society for Children with Autism Care. It's now called Peace Care, Peace Care for Autism. And uh, I worked with therapists there, um, and they taught me a lot of basic life skills, and they taught me how to read, they taught me how to talk, they taught me how to socialize, and don't forget I was just a little kid then, so. I mean, it's what you teach the little kids, basically, normal skills. So I learned to socialize, and uh, because that stuff was really hard for me. So I basically learned uh, to talk about functioning in life, I got points in my life. So it was a four year program. I was there from ages two to six. So that's the time that we lived in Calgary. Uh, we were really great uh, there. I have some very fond memories of it. In fact, I, in 2015, I got to meet one of my old therapists in Calgary, which was pretty special. Her name was Shannon, and I'm still friends with her on Facebook today. I did end up going to her in Calgary. So, uh, I guess it started, see, I started my school in there, but by the time that I started grade one, once I was done my office and program at age six, we decided to move back to Winnipeg. And when we moved back to Winnipeg, it was a change for all of us, but that's, uh, I started school here in Winnipeg, I started grade one at Scott Miller Elementary, and for the most part, elementary school was pretty good. And it wasn't that bad, uh, I did have friends there. Because when you're a kid, it's like everyone just fits in with each other. There's not any super rich and social norms, especially at age like 10 and 6 and 10 age. There's not a lot of rich and social norms. So people just giggle with each other and fit in. And so when I started to struggle more was in middle school with my social skills and making friends and stuff because I did have some really good friends in elementary school, like they hang out at recess, like we saw some of those other school, it was pretty good. Uh, but by the time I reached middle school, the social norms changed so fast. Me as uh, we're getting older, and what social expected me was different, and started to be caught up as much as we did anymore, if that makes sense. So it was hard for me because it was such a big change from like grade five to grade six was like one of the probably the most major change. And that was challenging for me because everyone started acting so growing up suddenly. And then for me with my problems with making friends and stuff, I've always been shy. So that was really, really, really hard for me to make that transition to middle school. But I managed. However, for the full three years of middle school, I didn't have a whole lot of friends, even though know, I tried. It was just really hard. Uh, during the lunch breaks and stuff, I would often sit in the corner by myself. I would feel left out. I would just feel sad that I didn't have a lot of friends. I tried, but it was, it was, it was hard at the time. But things changed when I got to high school. Uh, in high school, I started putting forth a really, really, really strong work to be my own parents and to socialize with people and to increase my uh, understanding and stuff. So I I've made some definitely some good friends in high school, you know, which I'm proud of. I uh, have on my social media, I talk to people all the time in my classes, and that's stuff that I never did in middle school or anything like that. A lot of people in this school know who I am, and a lot of people follow my Facebook now. 
so are you pretty proud of the fact that I've come so far and made all that progress there? Um, and that's a really good thing because it feels good to actually have some friends that accept me for who I am, especially after all the struggles. Because one of the biggest struggles for people that have autism is not just discrimination, not accepting who they are, people not understanding. Experience that so many times, it's really hard. It's, it's not fun, it's not easy. It's, but I've learned a lot from my life and I'm trying to do it every single day. Uh, one very special achievement is just this past year, for this past school year, actually last week, at my school awards ceremony, I ended up receiving an award for the third highest GPA in last year's grade 11 class, in 3.1. So that was pretty special for me because I put in a lot of work into my schoolwork. I studied a lot and uh, I just worked really hard. Because, I mean, grade 11 is easy, easy, high school is easy. I was taking chemistry, which I only can And uh, it's not it's not easy. So I put in a lot of work into my school, and I don't have to have anything modified or changed. All I have that's a little different is that I'm usually allowed to spend extra time on classes if I can get, which helps. Um, once I graduate from John Taylor this fall or um, next year, what I want to do is I want to apply to the University of Manitoba and I want to go there. Uh, I actually plan to apply this winter so that I can hopefully get into the Hulk of the Team term. And I want to eventually pursue a degree in medicine and my dream is to help me through cancer because I've seen what that can do to those kids is devastating and I think I have what it takes to be able to go that far in my life and to achieve stuff like that. I would love to even have like a doctor or a nurse to help me. And I think that since I worked hard in school and since I just worked hard in everything in my life, I think I'll be able to hopefully do that in the future. And I'm excited because I only have this school year left before I graduate from John Taylor and then I'll turn it into next summer and then hopefully go to university. It's exciting. Um, one of the main struggles that I've received there's just a couple of struggles that we're going to talk about here. Um, a struggle that is tough for this time of for others and others to is it's probably one of the hardest struggles. I don't have a job right now, but I need to get it in It's really hard to job interviews and stuff like that, and I've had job interviews where I just kind of done my best, but I kind of faltered a little bit and I stuttered, and it's just not easy. Uh, that is one of the most stressful situations that I've seen this week because we do the job interview when you're being respected to do that and you heard the way that you're expected to be shown what you want. You're expected to say all the right things. Imagine the stress. It's stressful for our people and it's not artistic. So imagine how stressful it is when you're someone who is artistic. I've experienced that many times. And uh, it's really hard and really frustrating. So just think of the stress that you have when you go into a job interview and you apply for a job that you've lasted for a year on this It literally is one of the most stressful experiences that you will ever have. And one of the most frustrating things is I feel, and I've had this experience many times where I've posted uh, videos on my page about this, I feel that employers don't really understand autistic people, that they think that they're just going to get hired and they're going to be like, yeah, like they're not. In fact, autistic people can actually be an asset to your workplace because. We often have special skills and focus on what we want to do. For example, if we know what we need to do and we're interested in what we do, we can get a job in every area without like working in two weeks. That's why like so many artists and people do have things in it and in the field of their special interests or stuff like that. Because if you just work really fast and artistic people can work really used to the workplace, maybe because we can see the world in a different way than most people, and that can actually be an asset in many aspects. And that's one of the things I always say about myself that is good, is that I can see things from multiple perspectives. When I feel that sometimes not every time I can, I can see things in a special way, and it's hard to explain what the trend is, but I can see things differently than most people, and that I think 
especially because they allow each other to stay in the community. And so I wish that employers would give on these people that are chairs and understand that they are accepting who they are because autistic people really can be created and should be lower uh, as long as they're giving a chance and uh, proper accommodations and we don't always give each other accommodations. Just if there's a couple things to be out there with a wider place or a little bit of a balance and stuff like that, it can definitely be very worthwhile to hire an autistic person. It's one of the best things uh, that they can do because they'll be independent of an autistic person's life and they'll be themselves get paid to by helping hire people that are just involved in the response to the internet site. Uh, he chose the same person who has challenges, but also has a few good experiences. Like I said, one of my strengths I think is the way it's promoted in the way. Um, everyone has their challenges, everyone has their, their strengths. One of the challenges for me is obviously, like I said, my social skills and issues, but they're getting better all the time now. I can make more friends and I'm more social and it's work in progress, but I'm not in progress so I think. Now, one of the main issues that autistic people seem to face, and I've probably seen some disinsensitive issues with clothing, is one of the toughest things. I have a really bad one of the people where they feel like, what if you couldn't feel like you could feel a negative clothing on that's causing your sensitive issues? If you couldn't feel like you had something to bring to your skin, even if this clothing is perfectly soft, it's just sort of the way the brain responds to certain flesh sensations, and it can actually play in so when an autistic person says that something is sensitive for them, it would be they could just accept that that they're having that and try to help them feel better or try to make an accommodation for that and they just keep the struggle. So oftentimes I don't like wearing jeans or really rough clothing. I can't wear shoes with clothes on or drive me out to because it's just way too hard because it feels like if I'm wearing a shirt and logo, it just feels like it's taking me too much chest. And they just need to be in heavy physical work. That's not what they're frustrated with sometimes. So I try to wear soft uh, clothing that's with belly and sometimes a jean that's with me. I did jean trim time to time because some days, one night, I'm going to feel fine with the wear and the next day it falls. It just depends on how you feel in that day and it's kind of whatever the right thing is for you, right? But sometimes, in some days, I think you should wear those jean others. Uh, I used to have bad sensations for the morning, and so I don't know why I like to see anything out of that. It used to be like when I would put on a school presentation or anything like that, I would have to wear a hat and go and I would have to wear earbuds because it was really hard on me, even when the noise wasn't loud for these people. One of the worst things ever was, and I still hate this today, is when we get fire drills at school because the noise is so loud. I put my hands over my ears and people look at me like I'm crazy. And it's boring because, like, what else am I supposed to do? It feels like it's busting my ears out. And then people look at me like I'm weird and they're high. And I don't know anything that's going on to do. But the problem is that if my ears are more sensitive than most people, they've gotten better over time. But they used to be really, really, really bad. Like, to the point where just to be a whole conversation will bother me sometimes. As I've gotten older, that slowly gets better. Um, so I'm kind of glad about that, that it's getting better. I think it's just that I want to to deal with the time right now, too. Um, the clothing issues are still on and on. Sometimes certain clothing will feel really sensitive, sometimes it will feel fine because of the day. One of the interesting things is if, my, like if I'm wet, like I just go in the shower or something like that, then I can't put on jeans or anything like that because the sensitive issues alternate. I have to feel a red spot or something like that. I have to have soft clothing on. Otherwise, it feels really different than my skin. It depends on my skin. Um, I just need to make my own points to the world, and uh, they really shouldn't be accepted for the job because we do a lot of great things, as you can see with that the job just being very hard to reach out to the people and people so far. And even when it's seen by Mark, some people are doing some. When something like that attaches the attention of one of the world's most powerful people who are Zuckerberg, that is incredible and it shows the power that just one person can help change. Because you've seen that with Matthew's already already. Um, and I'm a 
It's the neurodiversity the idea that everybody brings different and that it's okay. Um, as Canadians, we tend to talk about diversity quite a bit. We like to talk about cultural diversity, religious diversity, language diversity. We're very proud of our diversity. Uh, what neurodiversity brings in is just applying that same concept to the way that everybody's brain works in different ways. When I first came to the idea of neurodiversity, it opened up a whole new way for me to look at myself and my world. Suddenly, my brain wasn't weird and bad, it was weird and good. Um, autism has done one of the things in my life. It's made me detail-oriented, it's made me able to see patterns to everything around me, it's given me a different perspective, allowing me to question why things are the way they are, and who says they have to be. Uh, it's given me hundreds of simple joys, like the sweet pleasure of coming and dropping my hands around, or the way that I can just sink into a session and just see the whole rest of the world just slips away. Seriously, I don't understand how you guys have ever been like that. It's the best. <laughs> um, I know that. Yeah! <laughs> Uh, and one of the most important things that being autistic has done for me is it has given me access to an amazing community of other people whose brains work the way that I do. This community transcends national borders, and transcends cultures, and different types of identities. And I've been able to form connections with people who I never would have met otherwise. Uh, my life has been hugely improved by being autistic and becoming part of the neurodiversity movement. Uh, has allowed me to move past the stigma surrounding autism and learn how to celebrate being autism. Since many of you may be relatively new to the world of autism, you may be hearing a lot of never talk recently. Lots of long lists of things that your children will never be able to do because they're autistic. And uh, I can tell you, most of these lies. Or at the very least, they're highly oversimplified. So, for example, I'm autistic. I have a job, I go to university, I volunteer, I am in a relationship with somebody that I care about deeply, and I do these things a bit differently, but that doesn't mean that the ways that I do them are any less valid or that they don't exist. Um, and in some cases, the adaptations I have may actually be an advantage and give me sort of a step up over the people who do things in the ways that we think of as normal. So, for example, in my relationship, we have a clearly negotiated set of the guidelines written out in a Word document indicating what we like, what we dislike, what pet names to avoid, uh, the level of PDA that's appropriate, and so on and so forth. And we negotiated all of that before our first date. <laughs> um, this kind of explicit communication is unusual for most couples, as far as I understand it. Neurotypicals tend to have concepts of abstract social norms and uh, working on trying to trial and error, figure out what the other person likes. Um, but because neither of us are particularly good at picking up on social cues, we decided to communicate early and explicitly, and therefore we've avoided a lot of the conflicts and misunderstandings that a lot of neurotypical relationships this makes our relationship unusual, uh, but it also makes it far better than it would have been if we hadn't done that communication. Uh, so, even if your child does not do things normally, it doesn't mean that they're not going to do things in a way that is fulfilling. And even if they never hit those milestones, like getting a job or a relationship or a university degree, that's going to be okay too. There are many, many ways to live a happy and fulfilling life other than the traditional American. Uh, the important thing is that your child is happy and fulfilled, not that they hit all the same markers that are expected of their typical child. Sometimes the things you imagine and desire for your children are very different from the things that they would choose for themselves. If you've ever watched a young adult movie, you will know this. <laughs> um, my parents have also been a huge influence in my life, uh, helping me to grow into a healthy and happy autistic person. Um, from the time I was a small child, my home was always a place of love and acceptance. Uh, my parents' focus has always been on building their relationship with me and giving me a happy life rather than teaching me to be normal or to change my behaviors in any way. Um, when I refused to smile at anybody outside my immediate family for months, 
they just told me that these strange things that I would know all the human beings just follow them. When I resisted cuddling, they never forced the issue. They allowed me to set my own boundaries about my own body. Um, when I expressed joy by clapping my hands wildly in the air, my parents knew that no matter how I expressed it, the fact that I was happy was far more important than the fact that I was expressing it wrong. Um, this allowed me to grow up without a lot of the messages that a lot of my friends internalized, such as that they are broken or not good enough. Um, I was able to succeed because nobody ever told me that I would not be able to. Um, and I felt my parents loved me exactly as I was at a very young age. My parents also made an effort to connect with me on my terms. Uh, I've never been good at small talk. I probably never will be. The topic of, hello, nice photo we've been having. How are the kids? Just seems incredibly dull to me, and I don't understand why you can do that. <laughs> 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 so some people tend to assume that this means that I am unfriendly or I don't like to talk, uh, but in fact I'm very friendly. I just don't speak the language of small talk very well. Ask me about the news voice strike of 1899 and you will find out exactly how much I like to talk. <laughs> uh, and my parents understood this. Uh, they supported me in my interests, always encouraged me to share the things that I learned with them. Uh, and the time and energy they put into listening to me talk about Harry Potter for hours made me feel loved and like I had something valuable to give to the world. Uh, they allowed me to grow up enjoying my special interests, learning more about the world through them rather than trying to suppress them even more. And I know at this point some of you may be thinking that my story doesn't apply to you. Uh, maybe you're thinking, I got all the positive traits of autism and your kid uh, does all the things that makes things difficult. Uh, I promise you, this is not true. Uh, maybe your child is not verbal, and you don't think they'll ever learn to express themselves, at least to the people that they are closest to. And with a bit of creativity, that is almost always possible. So let me end with an example of an area where I still don't communicate well verbally, even today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I love my parents, and I'm extremely grateful to them for everything they've done for me but I almost never say the words, I love you, out loud to them. Uh, these words are very difficult to me, for me to say, not because I don't feel them, but because I feel it so intensely that the sheer strength of the emotion makes me unable to speak. Um, instead, I express my love by sharing my life with them. Every time I help them out around the house, every time I sit quietly beside them while we're doing our individual work, every time I tell them about special interests in intense detail, um, I'm telling them that I love them. To some people it may look like I don't feel love because I don't express it in a neurotypical way, but that could not be farther from the truth. Raising an autistic child means navigating a lot of good times and bad, uh, but it is true of raising any child, really. Uh, your child is amazing exactly as they are. Uh, they love you, they want to connect with you, and they're going to grow to be equally amazing adults. And autism is going to be a huge part of that. Thank you. All right, and let's give another round of applause for Angela and her wonderful family. They're really inspiring. I mean, hence why Angela called their uh, organization Inspire. Uh, I'm feeling pretty nervous right now. I haven't felt this nervous the one time party when there were girls. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go to the washroom and give myself a pep talk. Look, Adam, the more fair of you, the newer of them. <laughs> what the <that> bears? <laughs> uh, as you guys know, afterwards the neurological difference is usually characterized by challenges socializing, uh, trouble making eye contact, trouble with reading body language, uh, narrow interests forehand explanations. Asperger's and self delusion are dangerous combinations. <laughs> I mean, uh, my mom told me I was autistic when I was 12 years old, and at the time I thought that I was treated for being an autist. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried my hand at finger painting, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I tried my hand at pottery, that didn't work so either. I wasn't even the best autist in this class. <laughs> that was Kyle. 
to exam comedy, I feel like it's balancing on my fault. I'm never from more office than I do right now. But as I said, Asperger's is a delusion or a dangerous combination. I mean, I knew some people with Asperger's, and I wasn't like them, but they've got narrow interests. My interests are grasping on some things they care about, like dog dog country, dog dog fishing, <laughs> dog dog tennis. <laughs> But there were some times it was different. Like in elementary school, I was so bullied that a fast test dummy would be like, man, you've got it rough. <laughs> My only friend, uh, everyone that he used to be so funny, but I was using his butt of all of his jokes. And then gym class was usually one of the last people to pick. Me and the girls polio. Excuse me, go first. <laughs> And these people that I was weird and awkward. And since I had a film with my speech, I couldn't talk my films out. So I attempted to use my fists. That's a terrible solution when you got Asperger's. I mean, I could buy out, let's all get along kind of way. I mean, when you get Asperger's, you're not going to win many fights. I mean, it, uh, in a zombie apocalypse, it would probably be the first one to go. <laughs> It's meant for an explanation that I used to struggle with holding a pencil and tie my shoelaces. I used to get a tooling tab for that. Uh, and I also had some struggles academically. Like, uh, I was really slow to start reading, and that when I finally did start reading, uh, my principal called my parents in and was thrilled to say, Wow, your son's finally reading grade level. I didn't think he would ever read grade level. Which really confused her because she heard that people with Asperger's were supposed to be little savants. Uh, so, uh, let me tell you the story. When I was in elementary school, we used to be part of my school's running club. So one day, we went to the Sydney Boy Park for a race. Uh, it was a beautiful day, and everything started off fine. But 15 minutes into the race, one of my shoes came off. So I had two choices, either to stop and tie my shoelace and possibly give up, or I could keep going with one shoe on and one shoe off. <laughs> uh, so I kept going on with one shoe on and one shoe off, and I finished the race. I didn't win the race, but I was never going to win the race with two shoes. Having uh, the story is a true story, but it's also a metaphor for what life is like with Asperger's. I mean, uh, we're all running the same race. We all want the same things. Uh, friends, significant uh, other we love, a job where we are, feel respected and we feel like we're making a meaningful difference. But when you've had Asperger's, this, uh, you're in the same race and it's just eight times harder for you because you're running with one shoe on and one shoe off. Uh, when you've got Asperger's, that too often metaphorical, uh, it's represented by our challenges with socializing and our hand eye coordination. Uh, but we're also incredibly resilient. Like, uh, we often come, are able to meet many of the obstacles that get in our way and overcome them and just keep on going, plodding along. So, uh, I, like many other young people, uh, boys wanted to be a professional athlete growing up, but I didn't. That wasn't really a good uh, dream. I didn't have the best hand eye coordination. Like in high school, when I played on my high school basketball team, people didn't pass me the ball. But they thought passing me the ball was just as bad as turning the ball over. I also wanted to be an actor, but who would think that being an actor would be a good fit for someone with Asperger's? when we have a hard time reading and showing emotion. This is what it would look like. Begin scene. Guess what? What? There's a fire to this guy a giant tiger. Wow. <laughs> End scene. <laughs> you see. Guess what? What? You just won the lottery. Wow. 
can't see him. <laughs> <laughs> and then the director would call be like, Adam, we need some kind of emotion from you. We need something. And I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> Did someone just fart? <laughs> Uh, talking about actors, uh, people are constantly developing celebrity crushes, and celebrities are always saying things like, everyone, just like everyone else, so I wonder if there's any celebrities out there that develop crushes like complete nobodies, where they're like, mmm, you still plain looking, <laughs> and boring, <laughs> and poor, mmm, <laughs> That. <laughs> I bet listening to him could cure my insomnia. <laughs> uh, I also wanted to be a school teacher. I used to learn definitely of education uh, at the University of Winnipeg. I had good enough marks in high school. Uh, but the thing is, apparently you need social skills to be a teacher. Please, as they say, those who can do and those who can't teach. And I couldn't even do that. <laughs> uh, this one time, during my practicum, this kid came up to me after class, he complained about how he was being bullied. And I said, That's terrible. Who did it? He said, It was Stephanie. And I was like, There, there. You may as well get used to it. <laughs> You're going to be taking shit for pre girls the rest of your life. <laughs> Pretty people can get away with anything. I mean, who do you think I'll play for 9 11? Pretty people. <laughs> and who do you think I'll the 2011 stock market crash? Pretty people. And who do you think you always see in police lineups? Not pretty people. <laughs> <laughs> Not only did I have the, organ the social skills to be featured, but I didn't have it in any coordination or the organizational skills. At this one hand, time, I was teaching a unit about the teeth, and I'm sliding over the projector, and it was upside down. No one had noticed. Unfortunately, I got away with it. But this one time, I was teaching a unit about the Antarctic, and I put a slide in over my projector, and this one kid raised her hand and said, Mr. Schwartz, how come the iceberg is riding the penguin? <laughs> and I said, In my country, icebergs ride penguins. <laughs> <laughs> they don't say teaching didn't work. The kid walked all over me. This was one race I opened up and went. Uh, one constant thing in my life was that I had a speech impediment, so uh, this affected my ability to talk in front of large groups, to, like students, and my ability to talk to girls at the bar. So I eventually uh, went to these voice and diction classes put on by this retired acting uh, teacher. Uh, and the last assignment was to do a three minute stand up comedy routine. Uh, I didn't do enough preparing for it because I thought that it would be easy because I had always had my class laughing with and mostly at me. So I underprepared, but it didn't go very well. Uh, so I eventually went to the other comedy with Mike uh, to try to redeem myself. Uh, so instead of having to worry about going over to other people and making small talk, some of them even invited me to come sit with him and buy the beer. I was so in. <laughs> uh, but the only problem was that I was the only comedian there who looked at home and had a curfew. <laughs> but I had to go outside and I was going to a drug dealer. I've been a little like picking in the stuff. No, I haven't been drinking. Yes, I love you too. <laughs> Drug dealers, am I right? <laughs> uh, but the time that I got my most last was when, my, when I was my usual awkward self on stage. The more awkward I was, the more or less I got. So soon I started committing for those having Asperger's and being a giant social misfit. Uh, but stem comedy was a gave me a bit of a community and it also felt like it was more where I belonged and it was something that I could do. So I kept at it. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately Santa Comedy didn't pay the bills. Like Nancy mentioned, it's 
really hard to get a job when you do Asperger's. Uh, job interviews for people with Asperger's or all each of their own adventure stories. <laughs> that new member will pass you down to die. <laughs> 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 and they all have the same kind of questions like, what are some of your strengths? Well, I'm really good at video games, not too much racing video games. <laughs> Okay, well, what are some of your weaknesses? Well, I've got Asperger's, so it's dealer's choice. <laughs> Does it say, okay, well, what was the difficult situation you faced at work, and what did you learn from it? Well, this one time, I was working at the library, and this girl came in and asked if she could use the computer, and I said no, she should have a library card. I rolled the rules, and she sort of stapled in the head. <laughs> Taught me a very important lesson. I'd be a horrible positive negotiator. here. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be like, all right, I want a million dollars in a private airplane or else I'm off the news get it. And I'd be like, no. <laughs> then they'd be like, all right, I want a private airplane or else I'm off the news get it. And I'd be like, no. <laughs> then they'd be like, all right, I want a large pizza and a two liter diet coke or else I'm off the news get it. And I'd be like, no. <laughs> And then my supervisor would be like, Adam, why couldn't you just cut the lunch pizza and the two liter diet coke? And I would say, Sir, the rules are no negotiating with terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> they always end the job interview with this question What do you know about our company? That's a terrible question to ask someone to ask for since we have no filter. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, you have a terrific audience. Really great, really gorgeous. Thank you all of the day, I would. That's that is. <laughs> Seriously, it's an idiot that goes here and comes to me after the show. They don't scream me, also speak Swedish, Spanish, and Canadian. But you have those four. <laughs> and if you like uh, this presentation, you should check more inspire bits and also check my book. I've got Asperger, so I'm better than him. Don't tell mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, give another round of applause to Angela and her husband for bringing you to the I wish I could take all the credit, but there's lots and lots of families who have made this day possible and having the support from United Way and, um, and my team at Inspire also um, seen lots of credit and have been really incredible. Um, well, that was hilarious. That was just what I needed. Um, 